<laughs> team made their moves in the offseason, looked to be one of the true uh, contenders, not just in the East, but maybe for, for the whole thing. But the center position, that question mark is looming large right now. What, what do you think about it? I mean, the Mitch news came out, not really surprising for me, but what did you think about it and how that impacts things going forward? Yeah, not surprising for me either. I mean, I... I had heard all summer that Mitch's rehab was not progressing in the way that they had kind of hoped that it would. And if you put a gun to my head two months ago and said, is Mitch going to be ready for the start of the season? The first thing I would have said was, can you please remove the gun from my head? And then I'll answer. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that I would have said was, no, I don't think he's going to be ready for the start of the season. Uh, I don't think this news. I mean, you say you weren't surprised. Mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised. And I don't think the Knicks were surprised either. And I think if this became if this came out a month ago, I don't think the Knicks would have been surprised a month ago. I think they knew that this is kind of the track that Mitch's rehab was heading on. And, you know, one thing that was very clear in my in my process of checking in on the news, and, and it was reported originally by Jerome Weissman and Ian Begley had it. My colleague James Edwards had it. And when I checked in on it, one thing that was made very clear to me was make sure you say that they're targeting. December and January as a return date for Mitch. Not Mitch will yeah, return yeah. in December or January. Yeah. They're targeting December or January. And what I took from that was, okay, the goal is December or January. But if I report December or January is when he's going to be coming back, then that's not going to be accurate because he right. might not be back in December or January. And the implication, by the way, is not that he's going to be back in November or October. The implication is maybe it'll be later. Could be the later. Knicks are going to monitor his body wow. and they're going to see what it's going to be. And they're targeting December or January. And I do believe the most likely return date because of that is December or January. But mm -hmm. I do think there's a little bit of room open for it to be maybe even later than that, depending on how the rehab goes. I, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to go. I don't know when he's going to be back. I just know that he's not necessarily on the verge of it happening right now and it just hasn't progressed this summer like like you know it, it, it would have in a best case scenario and the knicks are gonna have to make do I, i'm not convinced that they're gonna make a trade in the short term it's really hard for salary salary cap reasons i'm sure we can get into it's really hard for them to just like pull off a trade in training camp and try to make something happen for somebody who's actually a worthwhile starting center and uh, I think they're going to have to kind of try to make do with the roster that they have right now. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you're not going to be perfect at every position, right? Everybody would love to have the luxury that, that Boston had uh, last year and going forward with how they, they built, in, in particular, their starting five. But with this team, it just doesn't seem like they're ready to hit the panic button on addressing the situation. They do have those first-round picks. You do have the McBride contract. But I don't think they want to make – such a harsh move without seeing first how plan A looks and plan B. And when you look at those, you know, when Tibbs said, because everybody has their eyes on, are they definitely going to go small? They have the ability now. When Tibbs told Steve Ashburner that, you know, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, you could see a, a Julius OG 4-5 tandem. That might be true, but I have a hard time thinking that he goes there that early in the season when those two guys are coming back from injury versus just go in the traditional, go Precious 5, go Sims 5, and see how it goes from there. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, 10 to 15 minutes doesn't sound like a ton. It actually is a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, you look at the the prime Golden State Warriors, like Warriors Dynasty winning titles, and they played the death lineup with Draymond at the 5, right? They were playing in that lineup 10 or 15 minutes. They would go to it at the end of close games and they would just run away with those games or they would go with go to it when they were down four with seven minutes left and they would just somehow end up winning by 11. And that was what they ended up doing with that lineup. And I could see a lineup with Julius at the five when everybody's healthy being deployed in a similar sort of way. The problem is. Like what happens, for example, last year, Mitchell Robinson gets hurt. And Isaiah Hartenstein doesn't move directly into the starting lineup, right? Right. Jericho Sims. Sims, Sims started start, 11 games. Yep. And he starts for five games after the initial uh, Mitchell Robinson injury in December. And he mostly got toasted in those yeah. games. Yeah. Mostly. And there were a lot of games, multiple games, where he got into early foul trouble 
or was, you know, given up too many offensive rebounds or something like that. And Tibbs pulled him literally three, four minutes into the game. And because he got pulled three, four minutes into the game, then Isaiah Hartenstein would come in. And Hartenstein would literally play the last 20, 21 minutes of the second half. Mm. He had to get away from that just to break up Hartenstein's minutes so he didn't have to play. If he's going to play 21 minutes a half, he's got to play 10 minutes and he's got to sub out at the yeah. two-minute marker of the first quarter. And then he's got to come back in at the 10-minute marker of the second quarter if he's going to play 20. So at least he can get a break during that run. You're not going to use Precious Achua that way. Like, you're not going to play Precious Achua 21 consecutive minutes or something mm -hmm. like that. And if Jericho Sims is getting roasted by first units or something like that, if Sims hasn't progressed enough to where he can't play that way, then you're going to have to play Randall at the five. You're going to have to play OG and Anobi at the five. Like, I don't, I don't really care about what the moniker is. Like, you're going to have to play somebody who is not a conventional center at the five, whether that's like Randall is your offensive five, Van Anobi is your defensive five, whatever else. Like, you're going to have to do that. I don't see them putting Ariel Hookporty into the rotation. Yeah, not Two way guy, second round pick. That's not how any team that has the hopes of winning a title operates let alone how they're going to operate. He's going to need to really show it in order to, to get into the rotation. Those other guys are going to get opportunities before him. And maybe you get to a place where Randall has to play more because you just literally have no other choice. Yeah. And I don't know how bad defensively those lineups will be because it's not the same thing as Julius Randall playing the five next to Obi Toppin. He's right. playing the yeah. five next to... OG Ananobi is one of the most versatile defender in the defenders in the league. Mikael Bridges, one of the most versatile defenders in the league. You can have Josh Hart out there or Dante DiVincenzo out there. And you got Brunson leading. You got Brunson running pick and rolls with Julius Randle with, if it's DiVincenzo instead of Hart, with three top-notch three-point shooters flanking to the wings in the corners. That's just going to be impossible to guard. Mm -hmm. That off, you're going to play crazy fast. I think even if that lineup is just passable defensively. Not even good, just passable. Just like you can get away with it. I think there's a world where that lineup, like of all the Knicks lineups, that is the lineup I'm I'm the most excited to watch. Because yeah. I'm not totally sure what the results are going to be, but I could see a world where offensively it's outrageous. Like, remember how impressive the Brunson Hartenstein pick and roll was last year? Yeah. Now imagine when it's Julius Randle, who like as good as Hartenstein was. Like yeah. he doesn't yeah. have the offensive skill set that Julius Randle does. And now it's Julius Randle who's setting the high screen for Brunson. Mm -hmm. And now you've also got Bridges out there spacing. You've also got DiVincenzo who's automatic out there spacing. You've also got Ananobi presumably now in the corners. We're like, he's not so threatening from the wing. From the corners, he's really good. You got Bridges in another quarter. You got DiVincenzo in the wing. Like, how do you guard that if you're a defense that's horrifying? You're going to try to blitz Brunson and give Julius Randle the monster that he is a four on three and Randle's going to get to make yeah. the right play, swing to someone in the corner, which is something he got better at last year, in my opinion, better than he's ever been. You're going to let him go to the rim like a bowling ball because he's, he's a beast when he gets momentum going at the rim. It's just going to be ridiculously difficult to guard that group. And I think there's a world where we see the Knicks with a fine success, but with a totally different identity than we're used to seeing them, where we're like, this is just a crazy yeah. offensive team because they've got that talent and they and, and they have that chemistry potentially. And, and that's what I like to see. Like, I kind of like this level of adversity this year for this team, like, because it'll test whether they can win differently than they have in the past because at least when you lost Mitch when they lost Mitch last year and previous years or at least last year rather you have Hartenstein step in and but you still maintain that identity they were still great on the boards you still had your in protection you still had solid defense in the paint now he's gone and as you said if, if Sims is not able to meet those expectations then you're gonna have to go <laughs> to that Julius and OG lineup. And if you lose some of your, your rebounding and, and some of your, your your rim protection, how do they win differently with that with that lineup? I think it's gonna be very interesting. Yeah, and it's gonna depend it look, it's gonna depend on which Randall you get to. Like we talk about size on defense and rim protection and all that, but part of it is rebounding as well. We're like, I don't have a problem with OG and OB guarding most fives. You're probably yeah. fine. 
if you want to say that you're worried about Ananobi, who has historical injury problems, if you're worried about him maybe being more likely to break down because he's guarding fives more, that's a conversation we can definitely have. But the thing that I worry about is that Ananobi is not a very good rebounding four, let alone a good rebounding five. And I think it's really going to hurt you. Julius Randle grabs a lot of rebounds for a power forward. And when he is fighting his ass off, he can get boards yeah. in traffic yeah. Yeah. for sure. Cause he's, str- he's, you know, one of the what 10 strongest players in the NBA. He's just so damn strong, but there are also times where it's like, yeah, Randall's standing there and he's not boxing anybody out. Right. And right. like, he's going to need to box everybody out all the time. If he's in that role. Yeah. He's going to have to play so much more of an important role on that front, just in the paint, boxing guys out, creating space, grabbing, getting, clearing the lane for other people to get rebounds and not just him. And, you know, I mentioned DiVincenzo as yeah. the fifth guy in that lineup. Maybe for that reason, it's Josh Hart, because maybe that lineup is not good enough defensively. And maybe Tibbs is like that lineup needs to be better defensively. There's enough shooting. There's enough skill players. There's enough creators you need a rebounder and you need somebody who, by the way, is going to be able to sky in over traffic and get rebounds. And there aren't very many people in the world who are as good at that as Josh Hart is. So maybe Hart is the guy who you try there. And that's kind of your, your, your death lineup that closes guys out. I think they have opportunities to play around and to build a sample and try them both Yeah, and say, okay, let's try this with Steven and see how it looks. And DiVincenzo is a pretty good rebounder for his position, but his position is not really going to churn out a phenomenal rebounder. Yeah. Hart is just a great rebounder, period. Not not with any sort of qualifier on it. You can try out that lineup with, with Josh Hart That's and see I'm how thinking. it works. Yeah. yeah. You can try out that lineup in a lot, a lot of different variations. So I, I think... I think they have an opportunity to build up a lot of different types of combinations and see what works and see what doesn't work and see how it works with Achua, see how it works with Sims, and then they can figure that stuff out. And then if and when Mitchell Robinson's back, and remember, he doesn't just have to return. He's got to be in shape. In shape. Because in shape. a lot of the time when he's returned from these lower extremity injuries, and I'm not blaming him, when you have ankle surgery, you can't run, you can't jump. You have ankle surgery. You can't do those things. And he has struggled to find a way to be able to come back in shape when he has those sorts of things. And last year when he came back in March, came back in April, he did not look like the guy that he was at the start of the year when he was playing, in my opinion, the best basketball of his life. You know, if he comes back in December or January, let's say, on schedule with where the Knicks are targeting him, but he's just looking kind of like last April, Mitch, that's very different than if he comes back and you're like, damn, this is the dude who can grab five rebounds a game and who can be one of the best defensive centers in the league and who's athletic and has energy and all these sorts of things. Like that's a very different type of player. So you want to get your experimentation done early in the season to see what you have. Because ultimately, like if I'm the Knicks, I'd rather win 51 games and know what I have than win 55 games and it comes to the playoffs and I got to go with a small lineup Scramble. Yeah. against the Boston Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. And I'm like, you know, I'm not sure if this lineup is better with Josh Hart or Dante DiVincenzo. Like, I think they need to take a little bit of a different approach in that sense because the goal, the goal has changed. The non-Brunson minutes were a bit of an issue last year. When you talk about tinkering with rotations and experimenting, that's where I wonder how do they utilize Bridges when he's with in in the trio of Julius and Jalen, and also is there, you know, a, a Bridges package where he's kind of running that second unit with Deuce, with Dante, with Hart, and, and so on. Yeah, I think there could be. I think that's got to be on the table. I mean, there's, I think you could reasonably <clears throat> say that maybe that's Julius Randle too. I personally would start with Bridges as my guy who I stagger with the second unit. Maybe even put OG Ananobi in there with him. Mm. Because I think if you have Ananobi out there with him, you have an opportunity to have an unbelievably stifling 
second unit defensively. Yeah, yeah. And and enough creators in the second unit to get you by. Because if you have Ananobi out there, then you've got Bridges, you've got Ananobi on the wings. My opinion, that's probably the best defensive wing combination in the NBA. Mm. You've got McBride, who's good guarding the ball against point guards. You've got DiVincenzo, really good in passing lanes. You've got Josh Hart, who is just an absolute maniac in every way possible. And you've got five guys. Like, Deuce McBride is probably your worst defender on the floor in that lineup. Yeah. And I don't say that as a slight on Deuce McBride. I like Deuce McBride defensively as much as anybody else does. That's my point. That is a pretty ridiculous defensive five sum to put out against second units. And I don't know how many second units are going to be able to score against you. And on the other end, you're not necessarily as worried that you don't have a conventional creator running things. You can have Bridges run things. I think Bridges is, you know, all this talk after Brooklyn about how Bridges isn't, isn't the number one and isn't the leader of an offense and all that kind of stuff. I think it's different when it's against second units. I think he actually showed that his passing got a little bit better when he was in Brooklyn. Mm. He showed that he has a little bit of that short mid range pull up game, yeah. which works well with the Knicks strategy. The Knicks like the the Knicks hate the long range, the long twos. Yeah. They hate them. Yeah. They don't want them. Tibbs hates, Tibbs hates them. I mean, people think of Tibbs as so old school. I can tell you right now. Tibbs hates an unnecessary long two. He's good with it from Jalen Brunson because Jalen Brunson's really, really, really good at yeah, it. Right, and the numbers right. will tell you when Jalen Brunson takes a long two with three seconds on the shot clock, that's not a bad shot. But Tibbs hates an unnecessary long two. He hates it when Julius Randle takes an unnecessary long two with 12 seconds on the shot clock, which is why you rarely see Julius Randle take those anymore. Those are normally threes or he's going to try to get to the rim. And that's basically the way that he's tried to edit his game. And with Bridges, a lot of Bridges uh, mid-range ends up coming catch catch and go. He's going to go one or two dribbles. He's going to pull up at eight to ten feet. And that's part of the Knicks game because you're going to have a much higher offensive rebound rate on those sorts of plays. Now, maybe their perspective of those kind of shots changes now that they don't have the elite offensive rebounders to go with that. Yeah. Yeah, they had a lot of data that said when you shoot from eight to 10 feet, the offensive rebound rate goes way up than when mm. you shoot from farther out. The foul rate goes a little bit up too. Brunson obviously kills from there. They have a lot of guys who kill from there, a lot of guys who kill with floaters. Yeah. Hartenstein would kill with floaters from there. You know, back in the day quickly would kill mm -hmm. with floaters from there. Uh, Randall will take a lot of shots from there. Uh, I could see them being fine enough offensively them having the shooting because they could be so good defensively and because they have so many ball hawks there, I could see them just getting out in transition like maniacs and Josh Hart just running the ball down people's throats all the damn time with like McBride flanking to the wing on the break. Yeah. And I could see that second unit being really, really good. That's something that, that I could absolutely see happening. You know, you could split up Randall and Brunson if you want I've always been of the belief that Brunson turns Randall into a different kind of operator. Mm. When you watch Randall play next to Brunson, he plays more patient. He plays like he plays like he knows he has an outlet. Yeah. He has this tremendous respect for Brunson and he tends to make that sort of less frantic play a lot more often than when he's without Brunson. I remember after the Ananobi trade, Tibbs tried splitting up Randall and Brunson for those first few games. Mm -hmm. And even against second units, they were just double teaming Randall in the post. And Randall was just like, oh man, what do I do? Where do I go? What happens here? And too many turnovers, too many bad passes, too much stagnance, didn't work. Tibbs got away from it, went to OG Ananobi staggering with the second unit. I would try it with Bridges. I would try it with Ananobi. Try it with Randall. Yeah. See how it works. You know, see, like like I said, there should be experimentation, but I think my first try would probably be with Bridges there. 